Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of End to Explain, and today we are talking about the killer rom-com thriller, Happily. If you're new to the channel, be sure to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to get videos just like this. And if you've never seen Happily and you don't want to be spoiled by it, we do have a spoiler-free movie review right here. You can go check that out. And without any further ado, spoilers ahead, let's talk about Happily. Tom and Janet have been happily married for 14 years. Every time they see each other, it's like for the first time. On average, they have sex about 2.5 times a day, and they never argue or have any resentment towards one another. When the movie opens, we see our happy couple attend a party for their friends Karen and Val. They go to the bathroom to have sex, and then after go home for round two. Karen and Val explain to their other friend, Arthur, that they're going home for round two. In short, Karen and Val, along with all their other friends, hate this. That night, Janet has a dream in which she sees several red chairs all set up in a circle. And as you know, they're the same red chairs that we see in the end of the film, but more on that later. The following night, they have dinner with Karen and Val, who essentially tells them that they've been uninvited to this upcoming weekend's Airbnb vacation getaway, saying that they're obnoxiously obsessed with one another and it's driving everyone else insane. That night, once again, Janet dreams about the red chairs in her backyard. Is this a glitch in the Matrix? Can Janet see into the future? What's going on here? The following morning, while on their way out, they find a man dressed in black standing on their front step. Who is this man? An agent from the Matrix? Rod Sterling? A member from the Adjustment Bureau? Men in Black? He takes him inside and informs him that he is prepared to take full responsibility for their mishap. That every few years they come across someone who has a defect, but two people with a malfunction is a rarity. He pulls out a briefcase containing two green syringes and tells them that they must take them in order to be normal again while also giving them a check for an undisclosed amount for their troubles. Tom, feeling overwhelmed, goes into the other room for a glass of water, in which Janet hits the man in the back of the head with a sculpture, killing him immediately. From there, Tom and Janet get rid of the body by burying him in the woods, and later that night, their friend Patricia calls them to re-invite them back to the weekend getaway. Wanting to get away for a few days, they happily accept, giving them a chance to have an alibi as well as figure out who could be behind what they now believe to be a prank from one of their resentful friends. The suspects are Patricia, Don, Maud, Carla, Karen, Val, Richard, and Greta. All just terrible people. The weekend carries on pretty awkwardly as the group for the most part tries to ignore Tom and Janet because as we all know, they all hate them. We see a movie screen of room which made me wonder if it was a clue to whom Goodman is. However, they're all just incredibly bad movies, including Hudson Hawk, a bad Andrew Dice Clay movie, and the one playing in the background is Plan 9 from Outer Space. You know, that terrible movie they were making in Ed Wood. Pull the string! Pull the string! <laughs> If you ask me, this was done intentionally by Goodman, and it was his intentions for the group to have an honest chat with one another rather than ignore each other with a movie. If you also notice, the puzzle that Richard is doing doesn't make any sense. All the pieces are gray, and there's no picture on the front of the box. Again, I don't think Goodman wants any of them avoiding one another. The group runs out of booze, so Janet goes on a beer run where, once again, she sees Goodman, very much alive and well. Not a scratch on him, standing in the produce aisle. Get it? Because he's a vegetable? Goodman gets in his car to drive away, and we see his license plate read California, KFBR 392, KFBR 392, KFBR 392, KFBR 392! Yes, this is a nod towards the movie, the cult classic, Mac Gruber, in which Mac Gruber, I think, is cut off on the highway, and he memorizes the license plate of the guy who cut him off, constantly saying it, writing it down, scribbling it in notebooks, and then eventually finding the guy by happenstance and torches his car. Now, does that mean that Goodman is the guy from MacGruber in some kind of shared universe? No, but I'm willing to bet dollars to don'ts that Ben David is a really big fan of the original cult classic film. Well played, sir. Well played. Janet calls Tom and tells him that Goodman is still alive, causing him to steal a gun from the gun room. When Janet gets back, the two tell the group exactly what happened and ask who might be behind it. All of them think the story is insane and deny being any part of it. Val even calls it something out of the Twilight Zone. They decide that they have to figure out what's in the vial, so they call Arthur, who happens to be a scientist, to see if he can come over with his microscope to figure out what it is. Mind you, Arthur could be seen wearing a shirt that says Cronenberg for president, and all I could think is that all of these characters are possibly in a virtual reality simulation, just like the characters in the movie Extends. 
a Cronenberg movie in which a game designer on the run from assassins must play her latest virtual reality creation with a marketing trainee to determine if the game has been damaged. It's a stretch, but you could see it, right? The group goes to bed and Tom puts the briefcase under the bed. And again, Janet dreams about the red chairs in the fog. What is going on? Is she a precog? Can she see the future? What gives? Tom wakes up to find out that Karen has stuck one of the needles in his ass and proceeds to have her way with him downstairs on the couch. Meanwhile, Janet wakes up in her bedroom, which is now glowing red, and sees on the TV the two of them getting it on. Okay, lots to unpack here. Was the vaccine legit or just a placebo? Why would Goodman want Janet to see Karen and Tom on the couch? Is he too sick, tired of seeing how perfect they all are? What is the point of all this? Tom goes to bed, and again, Janet sees those damn red chairs again. Ugh. The following morning, Tom goes to join Janet in the shower, but she blows him off, something that she has done for the very first time ever in the movie, proving that the serums are essentially fake. They are both real, normal people capable of having issues just like every other couple. I think. Right? Tom goes downstairs and sees a giant poster of Goodman on the wall that was not there yesterday, and he tells the gang that he's the guy and now realize that they are all inside of his house. They all immediately pack up and get out of there. That is, until they are stopped at the gate that is electrified, sending Don Don across the front lawn. From there, they receive a message on all of their phones to go back into the house, and they do. And now, the red freaking chairs. Janet sees them and is instantly reminded of her dreams. It was all leading to this moment. All ten of them sit down and suddenly Goodman's voice can be heard on the intercom. He tells them that they all have to have an Oz chat with one another and then they can leave. We quickly find out that all of them are essentially terrible people. Tom and Karen cheated with each other. Val is gay and has been screwing his sous chef for three years. Patricia took all of their money under the guise that it was for the house when it was really to help with their money problems. She only reinvited Tom and Janet for the extra cash. Carla also had an affair with Karen. And finally, we have Richard, literally the biggest dick of them all. His crime would be that he was physically abusing Gretel, and yet, yeah, he's, he's, he's just a piece of shit. From that point, Tom demands to be let out, and from the point of view of the security camera, which is glowing red again, we can see the group. But then, the camera flickers on and off very briefly. If you go frame by frame, you can see that they are not actually in the chairs. Is this older footage splicing together with the new footage? Or is there something else more supernatural going on? Maybe they're not even really there. The gate opens and guests begin to leave, leaving Janet and Tom. Goodman shows up and just when he's about to explain everything, Janet stops him and tells him that it doesn't matter and that he can go fuck himself. Tom rips up the check and the two leave, leaving a very small smirk on Goodman's face. Honestly, I think Goodman got what he wanted. He didn't want to destroy them all. He just wanted them to face up to their bullshit. Up until this point, Tom and Janet had never had a single disagreement for all of their 14 years of being married. Not only were they put up to the test, but they passed it. They overcame it as a couple. And while now they're just like everybody else, they're stronger as a couple, having tackling it all together. As she says to Arthur on the way out, the party's over, don't know what to tell ya. I think that means a little bit more, does it not? The same could be said for all the other couples. On the rise home, they all seem to be able to move forward from their mistakes. Except for Richard. Fuck that guy. And that's the story. A post credit scene shows that Gretel and Arthur have hit it off after Karen and Val set them up. So essentially everyone, except maybe Karen and Val, have gotten their happy ending. Well, that's not true. Val is probably still getting happy endings from his sous chef. And knowing Karen, she's probably getting happy endings from somebody's husband. Or, or wife. Who's to say? Now, when Milton came to the door with the needles, I assumed that they were in a simulation, considering the dialogue. We'll call the police, that won't matter. Not to mention the flickering lights, which would imply that there's some type of bigger presence at play here. Plus, just look at this guy. He lacks all traditional social norms. He comes across as a guy who just entered from another world and has no idea on how to talk to these people. When he smiles, his lips move back twice, like he's some type of malfunctioning robot. To be honest, I'm not really sure what to make of Goodman, and neither does the movie. He talked about both of them being defective, but Tom proved that not to be true when he slept with Karen. So what does this all mean? Does that mean that Janet is a defect and Tom isn't? Is Tom also a defect, but through the placebo effect of the shot, he thought he wasn't anymore? What can't be questioned is that Goodman is supernatural, wherever he might be from. I still think they're all inside some type of simulation. It's the only reason for how Goodman can make the lights flicker, move the painting so quickly, and get rid of all the furniture in such a short amount of time. Or, you know, the people themselves from the chairs. 
Seems a little glitchy, right? The movie doesn't care who he is, and neither should you. He's a plot device. He's there to get the characters to go where they need to. As I always say, movies got a movie. Boom! Put it on a t-shirt. Much like Ron Sterling in The Twilight Zone, who also at times was visible to the characters in the story, he's not important in the scheme of things. He tried to pull a Twilight Zone on the main characters, where typically they would all be destroyed by their own irony, but that doesn't happen. Tom and Janet decide they need new friends and make out. Patricia and Don Don revel in that they got to keep all the money despite their friends now knowing that they're all broke, and they talk about a new potential job for Don Don. Carla and Maude share a moment and talk about how much they miss the kids at home. Gretel shoots Richard in the back of the head because he deserves it. And yes, that's my favorite one. Actually, let's hit pause for a minute, shall we? This guy fucking deserved exactly what he got. All the clues of him beating up on Gretel totally make sense now when looking back. Starting at the beginning of the movie, when we find out that Richard is bringing a different fiance. What happened to the first fiance? Was he beaten up on her too? Then we have this awkward scene where we find out that the four characters all came together and Karen is less than happy about it. It's an awkward moment for nearly everyone. Patricia even asks if everything's okay and Karen replies with, it will be. Harkening back to later in the film when Richard tells the group that it was a problem that he is working on, implying that he probably told Karen and Val the same bullshit story about how he's working through his issues and it's an illness and you know, it's something that's not going to be an issue in the future. Honestly, I'm glad he's dead. <laughs> anyway, getting back to my point. Everyone has rose above their bullshit. Love has prevailed. The Twilight Zone can go fuck itself because you are in control and you make your own fate. Not cynical Ron Sterling with all of his cynicism towards society. I'm sorry, I meant Goodman. Which, you know, I think that makes for a sweet ending. The guns were simply a misdirect. Well... Mostly a misdirect. I'll admit, when I first saw the trailer, I thought this was going to be like the Belco experiment where they all grab guns and little by little people get killed off, but that doesn't happen. When asked where the idea came from, writer-director Ben David Grabinski said, The idea of the movie came almost from a love of the parents on TV shows I grew up with who always loved each other and had no conflict like the parents from the OC, or the parents from the movie Poltergeist, which is not a TV show, and I really wanted to see that idea of a movie from that perspective. He also said, and I always wanted to make a movie that felt like a 90 minute Twilight Zone episode. And these two things kind of fuse with each other, but I think that we all can't but help compare ourselves with other people if they have a better job, or a better relationship, or whatever. And I was trying to capture that kind of feeling and paranoia we have, which I also think can lead into some dark comedy as well. He also said, He's a fan of idiosyncratic offbeat romantic comedies such as Wild at Heart, Phantom Thread, even Gone Girl. Movies that have a romantic core but also just odd. But I just really like the idea of following the couple and making them the leads, the ones with no conflict and are happy and kind of just finding out. What would happen when they started to get insecure about it? And then these paranoid thriller elements start to go into it. When asked why he had the film end the way it does, he said, There's a million different ways the movie could go. But to me, this is a story I want to tell, and the reason I made it independently and not for a lot of money was because I really believed in, you know, without spoiling it, there's some bold choices you could say in how I resolve some of the stuff in the movie, and going in directions you probably wouldn't expect. And that was exciting for me, even if it might not be everyone's favorite approach to it. There's choices I made that could have end up being polarizing, but to me that's exciting. Ideally, I feel like two people could really love this movie, but also have arguments about aspects of it afterwards. I would never call it a horror movie per se, but you could take the first hour of this movie, and then have a last half hour that is a little bit more like Get Out, in tone, or like gets really fucked up, and for me, I just didn't want to take it in that direction. And you know, someone does die, but you could expect it to be a lot more violent than that. So there you have it folks, The Twilight Zone meets the parents from the OC. Just like Peter Gallagher! Much like The Twilight Zone, it has relatable protagonists thrown into a surrealistic morality tale filled with twists and turns. Although unlike The Twilight Zone, it didn't let it define them. I personally like the ending, it's hopeful when it didn't have to be. And personally, I found the intervention where all the parties were under scrutiny to be pretty damn funny. But what did you think of the movie happily? Be sure to comment in the comment section down below. And until next time, guys, thank you so much for watching. I've been John, you've been Burned, and we will see you next time.